Yeah, good morning, everybody. I uh, hope you have your coffees ready. I know I do. Um, it's great to have so many people here and we've been trying to put together um, a sustainable innovation event for some time. So I'm very excited to hear all the content today and we finally got there. And um, what better timing as well during COP26. Um, just yesterday, there was an announcement of $130 trillion of funding to be put into green energy and climate change. And Paul is here as well now, great stuff. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a super relevant topic and it's going to be really interesting to see how some of that funding might even flow through to some of uh, the speakers today. I'm going to just give a very quick overview of these. I think um, most of the people here know um, a lot about us um, so we can get into the meat of the, of the day. So um, really, so I'm, the, I'm John Green. I'm the chairman in Johannesburg of Visa and we're um, a business network um, from Cape Town all the way up to Nairobi. And we're here to really create opportunities between Southern Africa and Ireland and for people to participate in, in networking opportunities between uh, the two countries and to meet each other and to create opportunities for themselves. Um, I'm pleased to announce here for the first time as well that we've been accepted as new members to the EU Chamber of, um, of Business. Um, so it's very exciting to be, to be finally part of, of the EU Chamber now and that expands our network into all the other EU chapters now. Um, a lot of them are based around Johannesburg and uh, Pretoria, so um, we're looking forward to getting involved with them and our members to, to start meeting some of the people in, in the EU chambers. So as I said, it expands our network in much further into all the different countries, there are lots of different expertise. Um, so that brings me nicely into the, um, who we are in Visa here. We're um, a group of volunteers in the committee and we come from a diverse set of sectors uh, and fields. And that resonates into our membership as well, which is a growing network of people across different industries and fields. And that's why we, you see us doing lots of different webinars, like, like today doing sustainable innovation, like agriculture beforehand and FinTech before that. So um, the more um, exciting people that join the network, the more um, exciting webinars and things you can do. Um, so, um, we've got that packed agenda today. There's a lot of speakers here, so I'm going to keep it short. Um, if you have any comments or questions, please put them in the chat. So we'll keep questions and, and answers till the very end, apart from during the, the, the webinar on the chat. So you can please, please feel free to introduce yourself, um, ask some questions, and we'll, we'll try and answer it through the chat. Um, so without um, delaying any further, then I'd like to pass over to Yureshni, who's going to introduce our stellar panel of experts here today, and then we'll kick off on our content. Yureshni. Thanks. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks. Thanks for that. Thanks. Welcome, everyone. Lovely to have you all here today. So I am the events lead for um, BISA, and it is a great pleasure to welcome you and our stellar lineup of speakers. First up is Paul Dean, Second Secretary to the Embassy of Ireland in South Africa. So Paul is the Trade, Education, Skills and Cultural Counselor with the Embassy of Ireland in South Africa. And in this portfolio, Paul leads on private sector education and research partnerships between the two countries, Ireland and South Africa, and represents Ireland at meetings at EU trade, climate and agriculture uh, uh, meetings and councils in South Africa. So before being posted to the embassy in Pretoria, Paul was in the political division at the Department of Foreign Affairs in Dublin. And before joining the department, Paul was a political advisor in the Irish government and also worked as a corporate PR and public affairs consultant. Paul, thank you for joining us and, and for the opening remarks that you're about to give. Hand over to you. Many thanks, Reshni. I might just check briefly first that I'm audible and the sound is clear. Yes, Great. you are. Very good. Uh, thanks for the introduction and many thanks for having, uh, having me here in, the, in this webinar. Um, I was just thinking as I was setting up my camera that uh, having been here three weeks that uh, had I been in Ireland, I wouldn't have this the challenge of trying to avoid this shafts of sunlight coming through, but I also wouldn't have the benefit of the sunlight. So I'm balanced, I think, uh, happy to change climates. Uh, uh, from, from, from Ireland to here. Um, I thought I just might be useful to give a brief overview of some of the policy developments. Uh, John has already mentioned COP26, uh, uh, just to kind of lay the context before other, other, other speakers go into more detail uh, on some of the more business focused aspects. Um, so I'll just talk a bit about maybe direction of travel internationally, some, some of Ireland's initiatives as, in, as an example of the implementation of, of climate commitments in South African policy landscape, and then just name check a few initiatives 
that might be um, that might be of interest to, 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 to participants here on, on the webinar. Um, so just to, to set out internationally, I mean, you know, colleagues would be aware of, of, of the challenges uh, and this, the science is clear around, around climate change. The latest report from the IP, IPCC, the UN's climate scientists, has warned the pace of global warming is increasing. Uh, and there is a broad, more or less broad international consensus around two things. One, having global greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, and two, uh, reaching what they call global net zero or carbon neutrality, global net zero CO2 emissions by 2050. So those are kind of the headline goals as agreed at Paris uh, in 2015. And what you're seeing now in Glasgow, in this COP or conference of parties, is discussing the how and the commitments and the implementation that uh, holding countries uh, feet to the fire. Um, and what you're also hearing about at the moment is a phrase called just energy transition. Uh, and just to put that in context, it's essentially, as R.T. Chuck mentioned in his speech, about how those of us in the developed world, or what we like to call the global north now, have an obligation because the developed countries uh, have um, contributed most to the issue of climate change, have an obligation to support countries in the global south, including South Africa, with transitioning to cleaner energy sources and supporting workers and communities who might be risk left behind by the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy. It's something President Ramaphosa talked about in, in, a, in a Financial Times piece earlier this week. And also this week, an interesting and important announcement uh, was uh, on behalf of another no, number of countries, France, Germany, UK, US and the EU, of what they call International Just Energy Transition Partnership. And what this is committed to is supporting South Africa specifically to decarbonize and move away from coal. 77% uh, or three quarters of South Africa's energy is from coal. It's the largest emitter in Africa because of that. So this package or this announcement is basically around uh, a commitment for 8.5 billion do US dollars worth of grants, loans, investments, risk sharing instruments, uh, including mobilizing the private sector to prevent up to one to one and a half gigatons of emissions in the next 20 years, essentially to help South Africa speed up the process of uh, what could be a difficult and politically painful process of moving away from uh, large reliance on coal plants and fossil fuels and assisting workers and communities with that transition. So it's an interesting one to watch uh, and further sort of operational details are, are expected in, in the coming months. Uh, Ireland too is playing its part and the on Taoiseach announced uh, in, his, in his remarks in Glasgow that Ireland is going to double its contribution to developing countries along the same lines with a view to providing uh, a quarter of a billion or nearly or 225 million a year by 2025. Um, so just to give it a snapshot of, of Ireland as an example of countries that are now moving to hard, tangible commitments around climate change, and maybe, again, that sets the policy landscape for sustainable innovation opportunities and challenges, Ireland is committed to the 50% uh, target by 2030. Ireland is committed to net zero emissions by 2050. And domestically, you're seeing a system of carbon budgeting. Uh, there's a Climate Change Advisory Council that last week published the first carbon budget for Ireland. And the go government is going to publish a climate action plan for 2021 in the coming weeks. And this, I suppose, is an example, you know, of a country, a country level, of the how of the implementation of climate change, and which will have a follow-on impact in terms of the sustainable innovation landscape. And it's informed too by the EU picture, which is the key policy piece at EU level is the European Green Deal, which again commits to no net emissions of greenhouse gas gases by 2050. One other um, uh, point of interest in the EU policy landscape that, that participants might be, uh, want to be, wish to be, to be aware of is a legislative proposal the European Commission is bringing forward, expected to bring forward by the end of this year, uh, around um, essentially around due diligence and sustainable corporate governance, essentially requiring companies to carry out mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence and imposing new duties on company directors, uh, including in partner and source countries beyond Europe. Um, so it's, it's one to watch and it's one that could be of interest, but as I say, it's at the early stage in the legislative uh, process. Just moving on to South Africa and, and a brief reference to the, some of the policy, uh, po the pieces of the, of the policy makeup in South Africa that inform the, the industry and, and inform the policy context. The main and key piece of, of policy is the National Development Plan, which I'm sure you'll you all be well aware of. It sets out the overall direction of travel for South Africa up to 2030. And on sustainable innovation, particularly points of interest are that it targets the green economy and digital technology sectors as being areas where there's potential growth and employment for South Africa. It acknowledges the need to shift away from carbon intensive production. And that speaks to the 8.5 billion package that, that the uh, European countries have provided 
uh, and it aims for uh, one tenth of South Africa's power supply to be met by what it calls off-grid technology by 2030. There are two other specific policy pieces that are of interest in this area in South Africa. The, the REI PPP, as it's called, the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producer Program, essentially which provides, allows for the government and public sector to contract with private power producers, including uh, foreign producers, to supply energy to the national grid, which is obviously an ongoing challenge, uh, particularly here. Um, and obviously that presents potential opportunities for private sector investment, albeit the policy has a focus on localization and pre preferential procurement, giving preference to local suppliers and companies, but as well as, as foreign participation through investment. Uh, and uh, while there has not been, there had not been a significant amount of progress on this policy recently, up to recently, in March of this year, there was a new window launch with uh, five more uh, requests for proposals uh, in the specific areas of onshore wind and solar PV. And the last piece of the policy network um, in, in South African context is the integrated resource plan, which again talks about the electricity infrastructure and how a different a mix of energy is required, and again reinforces the need for renewables as well as gas to meet electricity demand. Uh, we had we had interacted with an economic consultant company who again spoke to spoke about how you know, coming out of these policies, what emerges is is opportunities in the renewable energy space, particularly in the wind and photovoltaic uh, systems. Um, so that's, that's the policy framework. I, I won't go on anymore. I just want to too much more. I just want to mention a couple of initiatives at at, at, at embassy level and others that, that we're working on. As we work in our embassy on a new strategy, where one of our aims in the next five years is to focus a bit more on climate action in our trade and economic research partnerships, uh, particularly in, including in agribusiness uh, in the region, including in, in research partnerships, which we do between research agencies in Ireland and South Africa. So that's going to be a focus. And we're also rolling out a pilot program uh, in hopefully early next year in February called the Tech Challenge, which essentially links South African entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs, up with Irish entrepreneurs, including a visit to Ireland, as well as funding, uh, to learn, to mentor, and, and to, to build partnerships. And we're particularly focusing on applications from the clean and green tech sector. So we're hoping to launch that Tech Challenge in early February 2022, and we'll of course be sure to, to keep the network informed uh, of that uh, in advance of, of the, the window open. And there are a couple of other initiatives we have at, at department level. The Africa Strategy and Innovation Fund um, is an internal fund for, for our missions and our embassies to manage and run pilot programs around climate, uh, climate action, um, but allows for private sector partners to pilot programs as well. So it's something that we are, it's, it's at the early stage, but it's something the embassy is exploring and there are potential for private sector partnerships there. Uh, likewise, uh, the climate, and these are all clunky enough uh, uh, acronyms, but the Climate Knowledge and Innovation Centre is a European initiative which Ireland has taken part of uh, through the Climate Launchpad, which essentially provides a competition for small green businesses to, to uh, for funding, for resources, for networking, uh, for climate projects. And we have funded projects in South Africa um, before. Um, two last mentions before I finish up. Uh, many of you will be aware of the, uh, the Africa Agri, -Develop Agri Food Development Programme, which the department runs, which the next call for proposals is in, I think, mid-Q1 of next year. It, it funds Irish companies to manage partnerships uh, with agri-food sectors in Africa, provides funding of either a quarter of a million or 100,000 for various projects and studies, and that too has an environmental um, component. I just want to finish by mentioning an upcoming event that uh, the EU delegation in South Africa is organising, Climate 360 event, which is a two-day virtual conference uh, providing a platform for climate change uh, discussions, uh, a competition to uh, promote South African small uh, green um, projects in the climate space. And the website for that is climate360.co.za. Uh, so it's one that colleagues might be interested in attending. So that's, um, that's, a, that's a, a brief run through of the policy landscape and some initiatives. Uh, it might help inform and set the wider context for, uh, for your for your further discussion. So many thanks for, for having me uh, again, and uh, the embassy is very much just to say, uh, you know, commending Visa for this event and uh, and this initiative. I think which is a very uh, very welcome one. Uh, so well done to John and colleagues in Nureshni, and look forward to the rest of the discussions. Many thanks. Thank you, Paul. That was that was an excellent, excellent sort of like feedback on what's been going on in Ireland. I think, especially with various countries in the world coming under fire at the COP26 summit, it's great to know that Ireland is obviously 
like has is, is trailblazing and and setting policies up and strategies in place and programs in place to actually address a really important issue of sustainable and in, like innovation and and uh, uh, obviously looking at solutions that would support like um, energy and and sustainability uh, globally and in Ireland and obviously looking at the policies that South Africa has and hopefully will come to pass and follow in the footsteps of Ireland and many other countries that are trailblazing in this space. So next I'd like to, to bring up Mark Bosher. Mark is the head of transformation and sustainability at Nedbank Business Banking. He is a chartered accountant and has 25 year track at Nedbank. He has uh, held various roles in different areas at Nedbank, ranging from financial management to strategy and innovation. Um, but he's taken up the opportunity to develop a renewable energy and efficiency financing offering, allowing him to combine his passion for sustainability with creative thinking. And this incorporates renewables, water conservation, recycling, where Nedbank has a variety of solutions that Mark is gonna talk to you about. So. Aside from wearing various hats, um, the transformation and sustainability hat, Mark is also quite the, the avid piano player, um, but we won't talk about his piano skills right now. Mark will hand over to you to, to lead on NetBank sustainable um, uh, energy programs and solutions. Thank you very much. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here and to chat to all the panelists. Um, Reshni, if you could bring up my slides, please, if you don't mind. Thanks. Um, that's great. Um, to start off with, uh, Nedbank, um, for those who know, um, has as its marketing livery or um, colors, if you want to call it that, a green logo. And um, they, the, those colors, sorry, my cat is now being silly. There we go. Um, the, the logo um, or the, the green colors um, put us firmly in position to be the green bank as well as far as sustainability is concerned. And right from the start, we uh, got involved in green financing, um, in um, turning our own business into a carbon neutral footprint. We were one of the first banks in Africa to do so and um, publicly proclaim it. With this development that we um, undertook, the innovation, we, uh, the focus was firmly on how does Nedbank green itself, how do we become more sustainable, how do we become more um, effective in how we um, uh, do our own business um, as far as the society is concerned and as far as um, the, the planet is concerned. As we became more and more known for our um, own developments and um, innovations, our clients started saying to us, but how can we do it? And that resulted in a, a, a serious look at ourselves and how do we as a bank um, assist clients and anybody else who may be interested to become um, sustainable. It started off um, in about 2014 where we launched our first um, uh, program or financing solution. That went very, very well. It was only in solar at that stage. Um, we were still testing the waters as you guys um, and the, the panelists and the, um, the audience out there are aware. Um, the United Nations then brought out the Sustainable Development Goals, um, the SDGs, 17 of them. And the bank had a look, very good look at those and said, well, where can we best um, innovate? As a result, this has become embedded in our DNA, and I know that sounds like a, um, one of these um, schools, um, economic schools um, uh, jargon, but it's actually one of those things that I can say with hand on the heart is that NetBank is embedded in their DNA and is also getting it to, to the clients. A typical example of many, uh, some of these examples is launching the first green bond um, for our clients um, so that you can invest in um, sustainable um, financing and in, uh, investments. Um, we similarly um, released our energy policy um, earlier this year where we undertook to um, not have any um, financing of coal or oil or fossil fuels, those things from 2030, um, which is um, a quite, quite an um, achievement to make and something that we're working towards. With the result is that we are now looking very much to um, where can we um, invest our, our, our skills and our, our funding um, to make up for those um, areas that we may start um, looking at from a different point of view. 
we found that we were very, very um, uh, well positioned um, with our various segments. Um, just go through them very quickly. We've got corporate investment banking, which deal with our very large clients, um, listed clients, and those kinds of um, clients, um, parastatals. And in that section, our specialists are, um, have great solutions for utility scale um, uh, uh, um, um, financing. Um, where the REAP um, program was mentioned earlier by um, Dean, uh, Paul Dean, and um, it is those kinds of things that we look at, 100 megawatts or more, and um, great specialists on board, a very dedicated team looking at that. My own section um, that I'm uh, a report into, business banking, looks at your medium to large companies, um, and that's where we developed quite an array of um, uh, um, products for our clients, as that is quite a big section and where we can do a lot, achieve a lot of um, assistance. We then have a retail and relationship banking, which is our SMEs, smaller and medium enterprises. Um, and there are some solutions as well. And then finally, but not least, um, we have in our retail section, we have um, a home and residential um, products that we can look at. To take you very quickly through what we offer um, in business banking, which I think is the audience where we're looking now, if you wouldn't mind just going on to the next slide, please, Rationing. Um, what we have there is um, affordable and clean energy, SDG 7, for those that are equipped in it or understand it. What we basically did is we said, how do you take something that people don't really want to purchase? They, it's not their niche um, business. They could manufacture widgets or they manuf or do deliver services. Generating electricity is not their, their, their main function. How do you do this so that clients don't have to um, lay out additional capex, have to lay out additional Additional um, cash flow, and how do you, you do? How do you do this um, in such a way that it works properly? We came up with a solution where we basically um, try and um, structure the repayments to equate or be very close to the savings that the client would make on the electricity bill. In effect, we're redirecting the electricity bill from the utility, um, ESCOM or the municipality, or whatever it is, um, to the bank. We've extended the term because we know that these products or these um, assets have a much longer payback period. And as a result, we can then structure it in such a way that there's really a negligible or no cash flow um, impact on the client when they put these um, panels up for owed use. And um, it, it works extremely well. So we're very um, pleased with that. We've got quite a book at the moment of photo uh, photovoltaic panels. We've seen some, some solar concentrators. Um, there's biomass equipment that's starting to pick up hydroelectricity. We look at various solutions and we'll also assist clients to finance on a similar basis um, any efficiencies that they may um, pick up by bringing in a new piece of equipment that uses less electricity or is less polluting or whatever the case may be. Um, the, the next slide, please, um, Rishni. On the next one, you'll note that we are looking at SDG 6, maybe not in the correct order, but um, South Africa, as everybody um, may be well aware, is a drought prone country. Um, we had some rather um, sweaty moments, if you want to call it that, in Cape Town a, couple, uh, a year or two ago, where we almost reached day zero with water. It is really something that one's got to look at. Unlike energy, you cannot generate it from nothing. I know we use sunlight, but basically you can't generate from nothing. All the um, the various um, <clears throat> geologists and um, biologists will tell you that we were given a certain amount of water when the planet was formed and that water is still in circulation. Um, so what we can do is we can harvest it, rainwater harvesting, we can um, purify, filter and um, uh, do um, various kinds of recycling on water and there are many clients out there and many businesses out there that actually provide this kind of um, service. We would similarly, on a similar basis, as previously discussed under um, the solar, we would have a look at what the saving would be on the water that you are recycling or that you are um, using um, and try and um, structure the repayments on any equipment that you purchase on a similar basis so that there's very little cash outflow. This works particularly well on agriculture um, where you could um, use efficient um, uh, 
uh, irrigation systems um, that are now becoming more and more um, uh, available. Um, slurry dams and tanks, uh, municipal treatment dams, recyclers, and, and those kinds of things. A, a wonderful um, opportunity to be in. Not something at the top of mind in South Africa at the moment. Um, we're seeing far more pick up or take up of our um, solar at this stage. And then not last but least on the next slide, if you wouldn't mind, Arishni, we have a look at um, SDG 12, um, which is responsible consumption and production. Under this one, we've delved very deeply into it and we've come up with um, our recycling um, offering that we've got, where we have a look, especially at PET plastic recycling uh, machines and those kinds of things. We've got some large recycling companies that are on our books that have made use of our innovative structures. We've got our sp uh, specialist finance um, team to actually get involved there because these um, interventions are hundreds of millions of rands, if not more, to import the equipment, to get it going and to create almost one of our first examples of a virtual green, well, not a virtual, the actual green um, economy. Um, a whole lot of um, these gleaners that you see on the streets that collect the plastic bottles and that basically take it to um, our various com uh, companies that we are uh, clients of ours. They get paid for it. They can feed their families. They can um, do their, um, uh, uh, basically improve their, their situation. And um, instead of um, companies that create plastic uh, goods, instead of the using raw materials and further creating pollution, they can now buy these recycled pellets to add to any additional um, uh, material that they need. So it works very, very well. And um, we're very proud to see some of our um, large um, clients really doing well in this space. That in a nutshell is what we look at um, and how we assist. Obviously, there are many other SDGs that we also um, sort, uh, have a look at to assist. Um, one of the latest ones that we've looked at is education, where we um, are trying to uh, create zero um, poverty. Um, and that works very well by providing fun funding for um, the lost middle, as they're called in South Africa, who may not be eligible for um, uh, bursaries. Um, or don't have um, the ability to pay for themselves at university or tertiary education. So we really, as I said earlier, we don't just say it's embedded in our DNA for marketing purposes. It's actually how we live and um, die at the end of the day. Thank you very much, um, Arishni. That's me. Thank you. The next slide is just um, contact your business banker or your um, banker to um, where you could, um, we can assist you in whatever you may be looking at. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for that rundown of what NetBank is obviously involved in, in the, the sustainable innovation space. From what you can see that NetBank is clearly has their fingers across the board in, in various types of companies offering solutions and supporting various types of sustainable innovation solutions to come to life and make a difference, not just to the environment, but to the lives of people in terms of employment and education as well. So please do reach out to, to Dean and to Mark, or you could come through via us to reach out to them if you want to learn more about what the, the Irish Embassy is doing and what uh, NetBank is offering and how you could almost partner together. Next, I'd like to introduce Paul O'Marion from Carbon Collect. So just a moment, I am... Um... So, Paul is the CEO of Carbon Collect, a climate tech company based out of Ireland, and he has over 25 years of global experience in technology, energy, and public sectors. He's the board member of Higher Education Authority in Ireland and was appointed to the Irish government's Export Trade Council in 2011. Earlier, he led Xerox's corp corporation's corporate venture fund in Britain, and he led the European custom consulting business for a U.S. consulting firm. Paul, it's a pleasure to have you join us today. I know that Carbon Collect is doing great things around the world, and we are really excited to hear from you, as well as your partners from DBSA, uh, Willy Myberg um, and team. So with that, uh, Paul, please feel free to share your presentation and take it away. Yeah. So I'm going to try and put up an image here. Hopefully you can see that. So great to be here today and look forward to meeting some of you in person. So 
just um, before I get into talking about what we're doing, um, sorry. So I don't know if you can still see that image or not. Not so, anymore. We, we could see it a second ago there, Paul. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So echoing some of the comments by Paul Dean, there has been that commitment this week of substantial international funding to support South Africa and its shift away from the use of coal for power production. Addressing the challenge of climate change as a potential as a new industry activity to replace all of the 90,000 jobs in South Africa in coal. These jobs will be in education, manufacturing, um infrastructure development construction engineering financial services for the trading of carbon credits and new industrial activities based on carbon dioxide and its derivatives we as a company plan to be deeply involved in this new act economic activity in south africa the economic benefits of what we refer to as climate business is increasingly being recognized by europe and the us and across asia it's an opportunity too for africa what we're talking about this morning is capturing carbon dioxide from the air, where an Irish company named Carbon Collect, and with a solution for capturing carbon dioxide from the air, the mechanical tree, we're a spin out company from Arizona State University in the US. Very quick history of our solution starts with a German physicist, Klaus Lackner, who's based at Arizona State University. Klaus is the pioneer in capturing carbon dioxide from ambient air and was the first to suggest capturing carbon dioxide from the air in the context of addressing climate change. That was back in <coughs> sorry, 1999 when the concentration of CO2 was not yet the major issue that has become. There's been a handful of companies globally building this type of solution and all based their technological approach on the early work of Klaus. These existing solutions have two key limitations. The first is the energy cost of capturing carbon dioxide. And the second is scaling. So being able to do this at sufficient scale to actually address climate change. And in context, the current cost of capture ranges from about $600 up to over $1,000 per tonne. All of these systems use large fans and blowers to mechanically suck in air at pressure and try to capture all of the air, of, sorry, all of the CO2 passing through their system. Scaling for these companies is building bigger machines and the largest commercial system now captures 4,000 tons per year. That's a tiny fraction of global emissions. The mechanical tree uses no energy to capture CO2. We have a thin column that stands in the wind and captures CO2 as the air blows past. It's barrel shaped, as I showed you there. Um, it's about 1.5 meters in diameter and about 2.5 meters in height. When we're catching CO2 from the air, this column extends like an accordion to a height of about 10 meters. Sorbents on a stack of 150 discs acts like a magnet to CO2. We, sit, we skim the CO2 from passing wind and not try to capture all of the CO2 passing near the machine. After about 20 minutes, the column drops down where we run a low energy process to release the CO2. The process repeats about 20 to 30 times per day, depending on the local weather conditions <coughs> and wind speeds. Each machine will capture around 82 kilograms per day and a cluster of 12 will capture a ton. We can install these machines alone or small numbers for capture and reuse of CO2. This can be used for manufacturing carbonated drinks or beer in industrial applications and in, in agriculture to replace fossil fuel derived carbon, carbon dioxide. So that's typically in either vertical farms or greenhouses. <laughs> Scaling will follow a similar approach to solar farms where we will have tens of thousands of these mechanical trees on a single site where the captured CO2 can be pumped under the ground for permanent disposal. Our engineering program kicked off in 2020 and we will have our first mechanical tree before the end of this year. Our business plan will see a scale and preparation for mass manufacturing by 2026. We will have smaller deployments prior to that. In perspective, 
over a 15 year period, each of these mechanical trees will capture at least 500 tons of CO2 compared to half a ton over the same time for a mature and natural tree. In the context of South Africa, one of our key investors, um, as was just mentioned in the introduction, is the Development Bank of Southern Africa. We're keen to see the technology deployed at an early stage in South Africa and in Africa. We have them participating here in this session today. So Willie Myberg, um, who may come in and, and just have a few words in, in a couple of minutes. Alongside this work <coughs> on the mechanical tree, we're collaborating with DBSA to create an academic research partnership um, or partnerships between South Africa, Africa, Europe, and the US. In this context, Arizona State University has an initiative known as the Global Futures Laboratory, which spans 560 climate scientists across the breadth of sustainability. We're talking to a number of Irish universities, and in South Africa, we have been talking for the last year and being involved with CSIR. And we're looking to engage South African research institutions over the next year and into the future. If any of you are interested in what we're doing with our technology or to engage in our research initiative, myself and Willie Myberg of DBSA will be delighted to connect. I'm very happy to take um, any questions later on. If you'd like to come in and just say a few words, Willie. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Uh, morning, all. Um, just uh, to confirm what Paul said there, we, so we saw the technology um, as, as an early mover uh, in terms of having the ability to, uh, in the long run, 2026 being mentioned, to make a dent in, in the amount of carbon in, in the atmosphere. And obviously our business case is, is premised on the green dividend that we see for this. Uh, so why we in this company, we, we invested early stage equity um, and we do uh, did that for, for the sake of climate change and, and the green dividend that we expect. Uh, commercially, obviously there will be dividends and there will be some form of return. But the reality for us is we want to make sure that um, when this gets off uh, into mass production that Africa and South Africa specifically is at the table um, to be part of this early moving, uh, early mover process. So we do have a lot of initiatives locally that we are working with, with local uh, entities and government institutions because our long-term um, goal for, for this uh, project is to have permanent sequestration um, because that's the only potential to actually affect climate change from a CO2 uh, perspective. So happy to be on this call today and thank you for your time. Thanks very much, Willie and Paul as well. <clears throat> um, such an exciting collaboration between Ireland and, and South Africa and Southern Africa. And the story is absolutely incredible. And I was hooked on the video, the unicorn hunters, uh, the whole story. So I suggest you guys Google it and have a look. Um, it might cost you 25 minutes of your, of your time, but it's going to be totally worth it. And hopefully all this um, new climate funding will help speed up the manufacturing and can go live with the mechanical trees. It's, it's such a game changer potentially and it'll be great to, to follow your story and we'll be sure it be so to keep following you and posting um updates and maybe we can hear from you again willie and paul again on how you're getting on in the future sure thank you thanks very much so next up um is catherine granger so she is from box uh, possibilities a award-winning green uh, tech company and i don't want to well, Take too much. I'll let Catherine do the speaking here, but um, I saw your product at Victoria Yards that one day and I was absolutely amazed at how amazing it was. And it's another game changer potentially for the continent. So Catherine, over to you. Thank you very much, John. Um, very great to be here today. Um, can you all see my screen? Great. Um, so, my name is Catherine Granger. As John said, I'm a proud Dubliner who's been in Joburg now for nearly a decade. Um, I'm a founding partner and the principal architect at Boxa Possibilities. Boxa is a construction technology company, and our product is Smart Green Space. We design scalable, sustainable, and transformational building solutions for African markets. Um, Boxa sits within the Ikigai Group, which is a holding structure and manufacturing and distribution platform. 
and through Ikigai, we source transformational construction systems and technologies from around the world, create local joint ventures to manufacture them here locally, and then integrate these systems to create transformational construction solutions for African markets. Sorry. So this is the premise that underpins our reason for being. The keyword here is transformation. At Boxo, we embrace a new generation of construction technologies and use them to reduce the environmental impact of construction practices. Winning hearts and minds and generating acceptance for these modern methods of construction is absolutely key. We deliberately don't refer to alternative technologies because it implies they're fringe systems. And in fact, these new methods now need to become mainstream and fast. The construction industry is an absolute beast. It accounts for 13% of global GDP, but it's a notoriously dirty, inefficient and fragmented sector. And it's responsible for almost a quarter of all raw material consumption globally, and for about 38% of global CO2 emissions. As we all know, we're in the throes of a massive global transformation. The sustainability revolution, driven by numerous factors, is accelerating like a meteorite through an atmosphere of environmental awareness and a new generation of conscious consumers. Markets are starting to reflect the realization that there is this big shift underway and significant investment into the green tech innovation especially into the development of new biomaterials and construction materials from non-extractive sources is really encouraging. And as a result, the construction tech industry is growing exponentially. The urgency for this transformation, as we're all acutely aware, cannot be overstated. Um, concrete was the wonder material that transformed construction, but it's become the most destructive material on earth. As an industry, we are addicted to concrete, the most consumed substance in the world, second only to water, um, and it's responsible for up to 8% of global CO2 emissions. It fills our rubbish dumps, it overheats our cities, it causes devastating floods, and uses vast quantities of sand and, res sand and water resources. So construction tech is enabling us to make a step change from traditional building materials. We're finally starting to see a move away from cementitious products, from wet sites, which are time consuming, unpredictable and incredibly wasteful. To give you an idea, on an average traditional build, you generally allow for between 10 to 15% wastage from the outset on all your materials that are specified from tiles to bricks to cement. And we're seeing this move to the use of more modular composite systems they, and modern methods of construction, which are cleaner, lighter, obviously easier and um, less CO2 in the transportation, far less waste, wasteful, and they use, often use no water. Construction waste is kept to an absolute minimum. So at Boxa, all of our units are modular. They're designed on grids, which use standard module sizes for all the components. And this helps us minimize waste and maximize efficiencies during transportation and the assembly of the buildings. Modular systems also enable us to combine the efficiencies and cost savings of mass production with the flexibility of individual customization for each project. So how are all these developments relevant to Africa? Um, Africa's population is going to double by 2050 to 2 billion people. An additional billion people on this continent in the next 30 years will inevitably increase the need for basic infrastructure. We all know Africa's development needs are already far from being met uh, using traditional building systems. The good news is that this new generation of sustainable building systems and off-grid technologies can be harnessed to accelerate essential development and to improve consistency and quality outcomes across the sector. We often hear about Africa's propensity to leapfrog developed markets. 
And we believe at Boxa that nowhere else on the planet is the need and opportunity for construction tech greater than here in Africa. From our experience to date and the sheer scale of the opportunity, we're convinced that Africa is the ideal sandbox in which to grow a green construction tech platform of global significance. So how are we at Boxer putting all of this into practice? We use pre-manufactured components, um, locally manufactured as far as possible, and uh, we're working to have all of our components manufactured locally. That is a journey. Um, we use no water, our sites are completely dry. We use no cement and we generate absolute minimal construction waste on our sites. Our units are high quality. They're designed to perform spatially, thermally, environmentally in terms of their life cycles. And um, speed of the build, far less energy gets used in the construction. Our buildings go up in days rather than months. Uh, the classroom you see there was built in five days and finished in seven, I think. Um, also, our units can be relocated and repurposed. So if a client does need to move a building, we can disassemble the building like a, a Lego set, relocate it and reassemble it somewhere else. So reducing construction waste. We also use a steel pile footing system, which means that the existing ground plane re remains below. So we're not pouring concrete into the earth, and there's huge benefits there for water absor absorption and for sensitive uh, ecological settings. Just wanted to show you very quickly how our buildings come together. So these are the three key components for our building envelopes. These are the concrete um, three steel pile foundations that you saw go in. There's then a timber subframe, a cross laminated timber floor slab, again, no concrete. And um, we then use a dry stack composite block walling system. They're like giant Lego blocks, essentially, which are made from fly ash or industrial waste sand combined with a resin, no firing in the process. We then have timber lamb beams on top and cross laminated timber roof and, and roof sheeting. So that's a typical boxer building in a nutshell. To give you an example of how we source and integrate international technologies and, and localize them, just wanted to quickly look at the walling system that we most commonly use. So the Ikigai Group um, has the exclusive license for South Africa to manufacture this polycare walling system. It's a German technology. And we now have funding and an agreement with Atlantis Foundries, which is in uh, the Western Cape. They manufacture truck engine blocks for Mercedes trucks. And they use sand to make the molds for their engine blocks. This sand previously had been going into, into landfill. We now are using their waste sand to create building blocks, which in turn will be used by Boxa and hopefully many others to build classroom blocks and other essential infrastructure. So the block plant we're hoping will be operational in early 2022 and uh, producing value um, from, from this waste stream. The other um, key component of our buildings is uh, cross laminated timber. It's dubbed the concrete of the future. BLT, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is being used now in Europe to build high-rise buildings, often replacing steel and concrete. And it's a way of turning renewable, fast-growing, sustainable, local and um, soft timber into a structural system. So essentially layers of softwood strips are pressed into sandwich panels, which give them structural properties. And they can be then used as floor or roof slabs, columns or beams. Uh, timber is also a carbon sink, so it has very obvious benefits there. So we have just started operating our very first CLT press in Hateng, in partnership again with the local um, South African timber and manufacturers and processors. And we're hoping to scale up production maybe rapidly. So I'd just like to show you a few box of projects that we've designed using these systems and technologies. Um, our aim is to design solutions that look and feel comfortable, inviting, hopefully inspire people to, to use these new technologies. 
Uh, the images here are of the Changemaker Centre that John referred to earlier. It's a community centre and classroom at Victoria Yards in Johannesburg. Um, our route to market has very deliberately been from the top down. So we want to make quality green spaces aspirational and to generate acceptance of these modern methods of construction. So we've started with the private sector and the NGO and corporate responsibility uh, spaces. OXA currently have five product categories in education, sanitation, uh, small-scale agile commercial, and then leisure and hospitality. The plan then is by bringing the manufacturing into Africa and specifically into South Africa at the moment, we want to generate scale, which will in turn reduce our production costs and enable us to tackle other essential infrastructures such as affordable housing, larger scale healthcare and educational facilities. So these are just a few of our projects and um, classrooms, workspaces, ECD spaces, early childhood development. Um, on the left in this slide here, you can see a proposal we've just done for a training center for a Belgian company called Lucas Noel. They do high, highly skilled training labs for vehicle design and um, uh, energy labs. Um, and they want to locate these in refugee camps so that um, they can train or people there who are highly skilled but unable to work can be trained up um, in essential skills for the countries they're now living in. The middle uh, images are the off-grid toilet block at Victoria Yards. Uh, the composting toilet system turns human waste into compost, which can be used on plants. It's powered completely by solar, it's completely off-grid, and it harvests rainwater off the roof uh, for the hand basin. And then on the right, there's our smallest unit. It's a little uh, toilet pod, all made from cross-laminated timber and was completely manufactured off-site and was installed in a matter of hours. And um, this was at a school in an informal settlement uh, just outside Boxburg. And the kids were previously using buckets because their teachers were so worried about them drowning in the chemical toilet. So that's work that we find very satisfying to do. Uh, the images on the top here are a project that we're currently busy with. It's a really nice one. Um, an eco lodge and marine conservation project uh, on an island in northern Mozambique. Uh, we leave in a couple of weeks to begin installation, which is very exciting. But essentially, it's a series of low density beach suites, all solar powered uh, with rainwater, grey water um, systems. And some of the income generated then goes into the conservation of over 150 square kilometers of reef and local community support and education programs. And so that's a nice one to be working on. There's arguments over who does the, the site inspections for that one. And the middle unit at the bottom is another tented unit that we've designed uh, that was in response to a lot of inquiries from bush camps conservation projects where they want buildings uh, for very delicate uh, ecologically sensitive areas. And um, yeah, so our, our building feels to use no water, which is a huge advantage to come in and go up like a Lego set in, in a matter of days. Um, I just wanted to end with a very short film that shows the two projects, the toilet block and the classroom at Victoria Yards in Joburg. Um, the composting off-grid toilet block was the very first box of building we ever did back in 2019. We've since completed about 20 buildings and have another 20 or so on the go at the moment. Um, we were very honoured earlier this year to have been awarded a Sustainable Design Award um, by the AFRISAM SIA uh, Sustainable Design Awards panel. And this was a little film that they put together and I think shows the units of Victoria Yards in use and really captures the essence of what we at Boxa are trying to do.
That's me. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to answer any questions that anyone has at the end. Thanks a million, Catherine. That's so cool. Um, you're, as you know, you're one of the inspirations for this concept. So it's brilliant to actually finally have you here um, and to hear about your, your exciting new products. That's it's amazing, especially, you know, to continue that uh, carbon reduction theme that we have gone today with after the mechanical trees. And I hopefully, you know, now that there's load shedding again, this off-grid technology and even the water shortages will help a little bit more and get the focus in there and help box it you know, come on to greater things. And I think, you know, if you're looking for volunteers to go down to Mozambique and test out um, the products, then I'm sure I would definitely put my hand up and sure you'll have other piece of people on as well. So best of luck um, with all your new projects and look forward to as well, keeping an eye on, on Box and what you're doing and then promoting some of your new products and stuff. And that's uh, amazing stuff. Thank you. Thanks so much. Love to join the back of the queue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so um, next we're going to have, we're going to hear from Liz Whitehouse. So she's one of the our big uh, visa supporters. She's the pathfinder for IDA here in, in South Africa. Um, and IDA have just launched their new strategy for 2021 to 2024 um, on sustainable growth. So it's perfect timing, I think, Liz, to come in and, and let's hear all about uh, the IDA's new initiatives. Great. Um, thank you very much, John, and thank you for the opportunity um, to speak to you this morning. Good morning to everyone. Um, I'll try and be brief. As um, John has indicated, I'm a pathfinder for IDA Ireland. Um, I've been doing this for the last year, two and a half years now. Is it? Yes, two and a half years. Um, and I'm just going to run quickly through uh, IDA's strategy because it addresses specifically issues around sustainability. Um, just to give you a brief background on IDA Ireland. So IDA is the Foreign Direct Investment Agency of Ireland. Um, it's 100% funded by the Irish government. And really their whole reason for being is to attract new foreign investment to Ireland and then to work with existing investors in Ireland to scale and develop their investments. Um, Ireland is, is recognized globally, as I'm sure you all know, as a location where companies can source excellent talent at competitive costs. And, and certainly from a South African perspective, that's a, that's a very important aspect of, of looking at Ireland as a location. Um, it's business friendly, English speaking, and the only English speaking country left in the European Union, which is a real benefit. Um, and I think that I don't think many people actually understand the, 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 how successful Ireland has been with its FDI. The world's top five software companies are located there, 14 of the 15 of the top medtech companies, 18 out of 25 of the top financial services companies, 10, 10 out of 10 on top pharma. So their track record is extraordinary. Um, just in terms of the strategic business focus, it's very, very specific what Ireland is good at and the types of businesses they're trying to attract. Um, technology, consumer business services, life sciences, engineering, industrial, clean tech, and then international financial services. And the types of um, roles or, or activities that are being carried out by these businesses in Ireland um, is global business service units, high value manufacturing, and then research development innovation. So um, a very clean and a very well thought out strategic business focus for Ireland in that regard. Just interestingly, in, in 2020, IDA has done incredibly well um, in terms of performance. And despite COVID, um, investments have, have grown um, th through this pandemic. So in 2020, over 20,000 new jobs were created through investment. There were 246 investments um, through IDA that we won. Um, and of these 95 were new name investments. So despite COVID, Ireland has, has continued to, to do very well in this area. Um, so IDEA has just launched this new strategy, which is driving recovery and sustainable growth. It's a strategy, a four-year strategy, um, 2021 through to 2024. Um, and IDEA has placed sustainable growth at the center of the strategy. And that is in line with government policy and with international consensus around issues in sustainability, the vision of clients, and also the demands of Irish citizens. Under this strategy, IDA will seek to grow, growth that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, while fostering an inc inclusive, sustainable, and resilient economy and society. Um, 
IBA's strategy is the, the sustainable growth, driving company sustainable growth is, is built around four, uh, five very distinct pillars, one of which um, is sustainability. And one of the key deliverables under that, um, that pillar specifically is to embrace a green recovery with 60 sustainable investments. So that is the target for, for IDA globally is to get 60 um, new investments, um, sustainability investments in Ireland in this period of the strategy. So what does this actually mean in terms of winning FDI and meeting the IDA metric of employment? So um, yeah, that is the metric that everyone at IDA has measured on, it's Irish jobs. Um, so really, I suppose there's three pillars to, the, to this strategy, the green economy strategy. The first is IDA clients and climate action. <clears throat> so IDA has um, 1,500 client companies that they work with in Ireland. They employ over a quarter of a million people. And IDA is actively working with all of these companies to help them decarbonize and wean them off fossil fuels um, and onto renewables. And um, IDA is partnering in this regard with the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland to achieve this. I think we're also partnering with Enterprise Ireland, um, trying to uh, address it through those means. So that is the, the one pillar is working with, with companies that are already invested in Ireland. Secondly, on the FDI side, um, IDA is promoting Ireland as a location for green economic activity. Um, and I'll just go on to the next slide here just to show you. So there's four subsectors of strategic interest that have been identified specifically for Ireland FDI. The first one is decarbonisation infrastructure. So things like wind turbine assembly, um, electricity grid flexibility and efficiency and R&D operation. These are, are just examples of the, the types of investment that we will look at. The next one is, is decarbonization technology. So that would be energy storage, carbon capture, um, sustainable materials technology. So for example, next generation battery development and manufacture or something around the green hydrogen um, development. The next one is um, pure play sustainability software. So that would be things, software that would be measured, management, analytics, circular enablement. Um, so an example, there would be sustainable software as a service, um, software development in Ireland. And then the last one, energy and sustainability service. So they're looking at supply chain assessment, consultancy research. Um, and an example, there would be an energy efficient consultancy service that sets up in Ireland to service the European Union as a whole. So those are specifically um, the types of new FDI that, that IDA is looking at attracting um, into Ireland. Just to go back to this one. So that's the, the second pillar. The third one is um, looking specifically at, at IDA and IDA's uh, Ireland's sustainability. Um, so IDA as, as an organization has a target to promote environmental sustainability in its own activities and to reduce its footprint. Um, the organization has set a target of a 25% improvement in energy efficiency by 2024. It's a steep target, but one that we're confident that we will meet. So for example, so IDA is the second largest property owner in Ireland, um, and the organization is continually assessing the potential for sustainable enhancements across that property portfolio. Um, and we're looking at things such as efficient public lighting, building uh, or, or getting sustainable transport links into business parks that are, are owned by IDA, those sorts of things. So those really are, if you take the IDA's strategy on sustainability, and this is how it, it translates at, a, at a, a very practical level, these are the, the three pillars of, of what IDA is focused on. Just in terms of, of Ireland's value proposition for a green economy for investment, um, I suppose looking at the new clients would be more interesting from, from a South African perspective. Number one is the attractive market. Um, certainly the Irish government has a, a, a serious ambition around um, moving Ireland and, and meeting targets and, and becoming a, a, a green economy. And this is aligned to EU ambitions. So um, you have the backup of government. There's also a range of financial supports available. IDA has certain financial supports and um, also the EU Green Deal funding um, is available to certain investments in Ireland. The next one is talent. Um, as I've mentioned, talent is, you know, Ireland is, is, is very lucky to have a very educated and, and well-qualified um, workforce that, that investors can tap into. And the last one is this collaborative ecosystem. Um, so Ireland is a global leader in terms of scientific research, and there's this incredibly strong link between government, industry, and academia in, in Ireland, which works very well and is certainly very attractive from an investment perspective. So that's really the, the IDA 
um, what IDEA is looking at in terms of their new strategy and sustainability. Before I go, I just wanted to mention one more. The, one of the other companies, the other organizations, Irish organizations that I work for in South Africa is Board Beer, which is the Irish Food Board. Um, and Board Beer has this, they have what they call Origin Green, um, and it's the world's only national food and drink sustainability program. It's quite unique, and it drives sustainability improvements across the entire value supply chain at a national level. Um, so Board Beer, 90% of food and uh, drink exports um, from Ireland are verified from, uh, are from verified Origin Green members, which is extraordinary. Um, so board beer is really encouraging Irish food and, and beverage industry to comply with this. And you'll see, so something like 84% of Irish farmers are conducting soil tests on a regular basis. 84% um, of food manufacturers have received a 17% reduction in water use per, per unit of outputs, uh, output. So it's a, it's a, it's a whole, um, it's a very well thought out system and it's a well thought out program and certainly something that the Irish food and, and beverage industry has brought into very solidly. And as I said, it's completely unique. There's no other country in the world that has a national sustainability program for the agricultural food and beverage sector. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'd be happy to, to take any questions on this later. Thank you for the opportunity. Great stuff, Liz. Thanks a million. And it's brilliant to have to hear that about Origin Green as well from Board Bia. I wasn't actually aware of that. So um, maybe you could send us some content. We can push it out through the, the Visa channels as well um, to just create a bit more awareness. Yeah, I would do. Thank you. Yeah. Right, so yeah, so it's cool to hear all that positivity. Yeah, like I said, coming out of Ireland and such progressive policies, and we're ahead of the game up with the climate change summit happening at the moment. So, and um, watch this space as well for it to explode out of Ireland. So that's great. Thank you, Liz. Um, and then yeah, so please post any comments or questions you have in the chat before we move on um, to our final speaker. So. Narissa Govender has joined us. She's a bit of a new face to Visa, having joined Enterprise Ireland in. June of this year. So welcome, Nurissa. I'm very excited to hear about what Enterprise Ireland are getting up to in the space. So over to you. Sure. Um, thanks, John. I, I'm still struggling with my presentation, so I might just unfortunately have to go ahead without it, but maybe if it can be shared afterwards um, with the participants, it'd be, it'd be great. Um, okay, so yeah, last presentation. Um, I, thanks, uh, guys at Visa. I know everyone must be just tied to death of um, PowerPoint at the moment, but uh, thankfully I'm not using one. So um, just to <laughs> introduce uh, myself, so my name is Narissa Govinda. I'm the senior market advisor looking after the urbanization portfolio of companies at Enterprise Ireland for Sub-Saharan Africa. So the companies I support cover a range of verticals, um, but mostly include high-tech construction, engineering, energy, water, and waste management companies. Um, so today I'll just briefly chat um, chat with you about Enterprise Ireland's approach to sustainable innovation over the next few years. So firstly, as you're all aware, Enterprise Ireland is the Irish government's trade and innovation agency. Um, so we are responsible for the development and growth of Irish enterprises in world markets. We support over 5,000 companies working in partnership with these Irish enterprises to help them start, grow, innovate, and win export sales. Um, just to mention as well that in 2020, Enterprise Island was ranked as the top venture capital investor in the world by deal count. Um, as Enterprise Island, you know, invests in innovative, innovative Irish companies, making an impact by driving change across industries worldwide. Um, so our export results for 2020, even though it was quite a challenging year due to the pandemic and Brexit, our export results actually steadied and even grew slightly by 0.3%. So this shows that Irish companies are resilient um, and they have innovated to ensure they continue to trade and in some cases even win new business. Um, the export results also show the strength of the Irish export sector um, as we have worked closely with these companies to support them in this challenging period. Back home in Ireland, um, our colleagues have tirelessly worked uh, to provide a range of COVID-19 uh, funding supports, including approving 181 million euro sustaining enterprise funding for 671 companies, sustaining more than 27,500 jobs. Um, so companies are quite positive 
about their outlook for 2022. So even with a tough year and a half, a recent survey we conducted shows that there's ambition and optimism among Irish businesses, with a massive 91% of exporters optimistic that sales will increase in 2022. Um, and ex exporters actually anticipate a boost of up to 8% by the end of 2021 as global markets reopen. Um, so sustainability and digital, uh, digitalization is a big focus. It's a focus for clients as well as Enterprise Ireland. So at the moment, we are in the process of developing a strategy for 2030. Um, and two of the most important, and prior, uh, important priorities include supporting our clients to take climate action and integrate sustainable business practices, as well as support them with digitalization of their enterprises to take advantage of global growth opportunities. Um, so uh, on my slide, you would have seen that they, um, actually 80% of businesses reported that digitalization was a priority for them over the next 12 months. And 63% uh, said that advancing the sustainability agenda uh, and adapting to climate change was a priority. Um, so this, these are funding supports that are available for clients. Um, so uh, to take action against climate change and prioritize sustainability being uh, as it is a critical area of focus, we are here to support Irish clients, uh, you know, in any way that we can uh, to progress to the next uh, stage or phase in their business journey. So we have developed a range of appropriate uh, advisory and funding supports for companies. Um, and that includes the Climate Enterprise Action Fund um, to help uh, Irish companies build their capabilities um, required to deliver sustainable products, services and business models. And the funds included here would be a Climate Action Voucher, uh, Green Start and Green Plus programs. And that's uh, just to support clients on various stages of their de decarbonization and sustainability journey. Uh, Moving on to digitalization. Um, so the, part, the pandemic has actually fast-tracked digitalization for a number of companies. Um, and you know, it actually showed that Irish companies with strong digital strategies and capabilities have been better able to recover and grow again in international markets. Um, so this increased uh, client engagement and need to sell online indicate the digital trans uh, that digital transformation is actually here to stay. Um, and to remain competitive, di digitalization needs to happen right now. Therefore, we've also developed you know, a range of advisory and funding supports um, to help Irish businesses achieve their full digital potential. Um, and there's a number of different supports, but I would say the, the first one is the digital ready uh, scorecard. That's just to test if a company is you know, where they are in the digitalization journey and then identify any gaps with it, which they need to develop. And then there's other supports that are funding related. So digitalization vouchers, Lean Plus, business innovation, capital investment in SMEs, uh, Lean Transform program and business innovation, business model transformation. Um, so to conclude, uh, Enterprise Ireland uh, continues to play a pivotal role in supporting Irish companies to thrive, uh, grow through securing opportunities in Africa and globally, and plays an important role in global recovery as we emerge from this pandemic. You know, building a future that is more sustainable, prosperous, and secures a future for, gen for generations to come. Um, thank you for giving me your time and attention during this presentation. I look forward to hopefully meeting most of you soon in person. Uh, so back to you, John. Thanks very much, Nersa. Yeah, and uh, please do send through your content and we'll make sure to get it out to our members. Um, yeah, so it's great to hear that consistent message of, you know, the progressive policies with sustainable um, adaptability to climate change and decarbonisation running through the, the whole webinar as well. So thanks very much for that. And likewise, I look forward to meeting you in person then at the next event. And uh, maybe it's the next event I'll mention in a few minutes. So um, thank you. And um, so thanks, if anybody has any questions, please, you know, raise your hand or post it in the chat. Um, while I'm just, I'll just wrap up with a few comments or maybe people want to digest a lot of that information there was a there was a, there was a huge amount going on and it was um it's incredible to hear like the full spectrum there from funding through the private sector all the way through the public sector and um, from nedbank to the irish government agencies and through the government itself and um, this topic is, is very close to my heart and i've been looking to do something like this for some time so i'm 
absolutely blown away by the content today and all of the speakers. It's been absolutely um, amazing. Um, and some of the incredible examples that we went through, like the mechanical trees and then the box of possibilities and their, their new products would actually be brilliant. Um, the, I have to obviously mention as well that this being a very sustainable format um, resonates a lot more with me than uh, what's going on at COP26 at the moment. Um, slightly facetious comment, but I think that we've got it right by doing it in webinar format. Um, I'd like to thank Gureshni, who's had to drop off, and David for, for their help in making this happen and putting out all that digital content. Um, I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of content coming out of this webinar today, so please keep an eye on Visa's social media on our LinkedIn and our Twitter, so we'll get some comments out there. I'd like to hear, like, join the, you know, the conversation on social media to get this going while the, the Climate Change Summit is happening and ask some difficult questions and let, let's get that conversation happening online. Um, and like I just mentioned, the um, the next visa event is a Waterford whiskey tasting on the 11th in person, if you want to actually meet some of the, the faces that are on the on the call today. So um, that's another sustainable innovation company really um, with a really exciting whiskey product. So keep an eye out for the Thursday next week, actually this, this day next week. Um, it's going to be a really cool event. So let me just check the chat to see if there are any questions. Um, Tumaleng, you have a question. Would you like to, David, would you like to spotlight Tumaleng? She can come in and ask the question to Catherine. Just waiting for David, is that possible? Or shall I feel the question? Okay, Tumulang, you're here. Great to see you here this morning after meeting last night. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go Good ahead. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you so much for the, the presentation. I was just interested by the, the presentation by Catherine. And I was one, just wondering what the, you know, reality of sort of special politics in, in, in South Africa, but in Johannesburg, for instance, um, and just wondering about, you know, the opportunities and possibilities that exist between the approach that you presented and the kind of uh, housing that government provides. And obviously thinking about it in the context of, um, you know, climate change and all of that to say, um, is it, is there something that is, are there possible partnerships between that kind of approach and government? And is there anything sort of that's done towards that? Um, yeah, and I think just the question that was asked here in the, I think there's a poll that's running that was asking us about whether we think South Africa will be able to deal with the electricity, provide clean energy by the next 15 years. And I think that question links to the question of housing to say, in the next 15 years, what will, you know, the spatial politics of mega cities look like and what kind of approaches can be sort of intertwined with, you know, alternatives like the one you presented? So thank you so much for your um, question. Um, so as I briefly touched on in my presentation, our aim at the moment is we very deliberately started at the, at the top in our route to market and we've gone through the private sector and there's, there's very deliberate reasons for doing that. Um, the affordable housing sector, as I'm sure you're aware, is littered with uh, alternative building systems, a lot of them panelized and um, rapid build technologies that have been used through the years by various companies and a lot of them haven't worked and I think a lot of that has been because there hasn't been acceptance of the technologies and um, panelized systems also unfortunately um, to do with shack homes and so on in this continent have just not been uh, accepted culturally which is 
hugely understandable. And I think what we're trying to do is build quality units that generate acceptance. So people see them and they almost become aspirational. So if you take your child to a classroom and you feel the building or you go to a doctor or to a clinic and you feel the building or you work in a space and you see that it doesn't get too hot in summer, it doesn't get too cold in winter and that these technologies actually work and that they're dignified quality spaces. Um, I think firstly that builds acceptance and it starts changing and winning hearts and minds over to new ways of building. And the second reason for doing that is that at the moment our price point is comparable to bricks and mortar of a similar quality, so insulated to the same degree and um, with the same kind of quality of finishes. What we are doing by locally manufacturing the components that we want to use in our, our buildings is well, one, creating jobs, and two, is bringing the supply to making it locally. And what we're hoping to do through that is achieve scale and therefore be able to drop our price point to a point where we can produce quality, affordable housing and other affordable buildings at an affordable price point. So it's a, it's a very deliberate strategy um, on, on several levels. There's also for affordable housing, a lot of regulatory hoops and so on that you have to um, meet. And a lot of these building technologies being new, we're going through an approval process um, at the same time. And the housing regulations are some of the strictest around, rightly so. Um, so it's, it's, it's a process of, um, of, of, of getting approvals. It's a process of um, Agrimont certificates for everything and of getting scale critically so that we can get our, our price point right for that kind of application. Thanks, Catherine. That was a, that was a great answer. And I think something that we're, we're looking at as as BISA and being part of the EU Chamber now is how to unpick some of these barriers to growth. And um, maybe I'll pick it up with you again about some of the, the, the aspects there that we could maybe address at a government level. Um, and Paul Dean there, we're going to be chatting to him as well about some of the other um, BISA members are having problems with, with some of the red tape and things like that. So definitely something interesting to bring up. Um, so there was one more question for you, Catherine. Um, it was from Willie Cross. So he, he wanted to know, um, kind of make a big impact on the RDP housing market. So I think you've kind of addressed that a bit. And um, yeah, hopefully, you know, we're going to see that happen in the future. Um, is there any further questions anybody has? Or um, let me just give it two seconds. I think, I think that's it, really. Um, I think the content it speaks for itself. Everybody has um, answered everything so well. I think, Willie, is there any further questions? I see you're, you're here. Yeah, uh, you know, that basically, uh, Johnny, uh, uh, just from Catherine, um, the uh, actual cost of the, uh, of the uh, product, the box of products, um, you know, will that be able to compete uh, with the traditional methodologies in due course, uh, Catherine? Yeah, so that absolutely is our plan. Um, as I said before, we're currently matching um, buildings used using traditional building materials of a similar quality. So we have done those studies and we're currently on a par with those. Square meter rates are very dangerous because everyone includes different things in them, but, but we have done the studies with quantity surveyors and we know that we are on a level. And that's before we achieve any real scale. Um, so we've just got funding to um, build that plant to make the walling system locally. We've also just pressed our first cross laminated timber panels in Hateng. And so those are two key, key components of our, of our units. And so the hope there is, or the plan there is, to uh, yeah, generate scale and drop those price points. And um, we, our business plan allows for it to be competitive with RDP pricing, but far greater quality than, than what is currently available. And far much, the... Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Willie. Uh, I think we, we've come to the end now of the webinar, so I'd just like to say a sincere thank you to all our panellists and for 
uh, amazing content and I really look forward to, to seeing how, watching your stories going forward. So from Paul Dean, we're going to see a lot more of him. Um, thanks very much, Catherine, um, for answering the questions and for, for all your content. It was fantastic. And then uh, Paul, um, I really want to see you in person as well. I'm, I can't wait to see more about the mechanical trees and making a, a huge difference um, in Africa and globally. That's so going to be amazing. And then thanks a million, Liz and Larissa as well from our agencies, IBA and EI. And thanks for everybody for listening and please keep an eye on the Visa social media and hopefully we will see you at our whiskey tasting on the 11th of November. So let's keep an eye um, on our social media for that and maybe let's meet in person. And so thanks everybody for joining and we'll see you again soon.